Welcome to The Weaver Sews. I'm Daryl Lancaster. First, I need to say that I love to weave cloth. When I set up my loom, I have no plans for what that cloth will become, except that it will most likely become a garment because that's what I do. Sometimes, as I weave, ideas start to pop into my head, you know, what I think this cloth might want to be, you know, which may or may not be realistic. But I weave cloth based on what yarn I have available, what structure inspires me to go to the loom, and that's the size of the cloth that I end up with. There is some initial waste, I, I will say, in sampling, which I have covered in a previous video. That link will be below. Um, but basically, when a cloth is finished, I wash and press it, roll it up, and now I have a new raw material for sewing. Occasionally, truth be told, yeah, um, more often than I'd like to admit, uh, I don't actually end up having enough fabric to do what I want. Uh, this, of course, never stops me. It just makes me more creative. But yeah, this happens all the time. So the most obvious fix to not enough fabric is to add a commercial fabric as a companion. Let me show you some examples of that. This dragonfly jacket, um, I didn't have a whole lot of fabric, and I picked princess seams because I could get narrower pieces here. In fact, I actually didn't have enough fabric to get the full panel that I needed here, and there's a very small seam right here where I actually added enough extra to give me what I needed to get to the front. This has a companion fabric that is uh, extending the borders. And I actually used that for the back of the sleeves because I just didn't have the width in the sleeve. This is one of my favorite more recent pieces. I made this plaid fabric from all of my leftover knitting thrums and uh, an occasional skein that I had from here and there that people gave me as gifts. You know, what do you do with one skein of hand spun? And I was able to create this plaid, and I only had so much width. So I knew that I couldn't get a full coat out of it, but it's sort of red coat to me. And so I added panels of this beautiful camel hair. All of the uh, details are made with the camel hair, the bound buttonholes, the two-piece sleeve, the underneath part that goes into the underarm is also the camel fabric. This is interesting because this fabric was so little, I had no options for joining um, and making the shoulders match. So I created this epaulette pattern which will cover any mismatched seam. And just as a, um, a note, I wanted to give the illusion of this shaped back, but I didn't have enough fabric to be able to do two separate panels. So even though this is one panel across, it's completely flat here. But I did, a, instead of a back seam with shaping, I did a dart, which then tapers to nothing so I have the full back. So it's an interesting cheat as well. This lovely summer blouse um, was actually made from a couple of scarves. Uh, they, I wove them a little too dense for a scarf that I would like around my neck, and they're kind of summery colors. I saw them more as a blouse. So all I had were these scarf widths, and so the rest of it is a dupioni silk that I had in my stash, and I just filled out the rest of the garment with the silk. This is a piece that's very near and dear to my heart. Back in the 1970s, when I was learning how to weave in a fine arts program at a local university, um, I wove my first yardage. This, has been, this was sitting on the shelf for years. I finally one day decided it was time to make it up. It was a very coarse woven fabric. It had uh, was early bulky yarns, and there wasn't a lot of it. 
So I had this cotton fabric on my shelf, which was this very weird green color, almost identical to the green that, were, that was in these warp threads here. It was just a thin cotton, and this was a very bulky fabric. So I took a twin needle and some quilt batting, and I actually quilted the surface of this to bulk it up to give it the same kind of loft that this handwoven fabric had. And there's the back. And you can see it wasn't a lot of fabric, but I was able to get a full vest, you know, by some creative machine work. You may recognize the fabric here. I used this in some early videos on this YouTube channel, and I never showed it finished. I did finish it. This was a very, very sleazy, loosely woven Chanel type fabric. It was commercial. I purchased it commercially. I did not weave it, but it simulated a lot of what happens when you have loosely woven hand wovens. So here the vest is finished and I had just enough fabric to be able to get the body of the vest front and back and one of the collars, but I did not have enough to do the under collar part. So I chose the same fabric as the lining for that. But here's the interesting situation. The under collar then rolls forward and becomes the lower front band. So how do I make this transition where I have the upper collar as the outer fabric and the band as the outer fabric. So what I ended up doing was creating a seam midway between the under collar or an upper collar, both, both pieces I did the same thing, and the band and facing, and then switched fabrics. The seam became the buttonhole opening. Very clever way of creating the illusion of the same fabric, but in fact, the facing of the band and the under collar are two different fabrics, the same as the lining. This is another piece that is also near and dear to my heart. I did craft fairs for 10 years in the 1980s, selling my handwoven fabrics made into garments to you know, my uh, very attentive public. And I love doing it and I learned a lot. And occasionally I will root through my attic and find an old piece left over from my craft fair days. Back then, the fabrics that I made were a little looser set than I would do now. That's S-E-T-T, -T, if you're not a weaver and have no idea what that means. That's the density of the warp together, you know, so how many ends you would have in an inch. And I did underset my fabrics. Some of it was cost, and some of it was I didn't know any better. But that said, this dress originally was made into a tea dress straight across the shoulders into two sleeves and then came back in and went down the body. Very simple, basic, a rectangular shaped dress. I didn't like the dress. It didn't look good on me. I'm not sure it even fit in the um, hip area, but I liked the fabric and the fabric had enough potential that I thought, let me take it apart and see what I could do with it. In addition, I also found this purple wool crepe that was made into a pair of kind of elephant leg pants that has been sitting in my closet forever. They never fit me. I don't know where I actually even got them, but it was the right fabric for this job. You know, purple and gold are complementary colors. So I took the dress completely apart. I have a good amount for the back. And then I was able to create these panels with this complementary fabric using up an old pair of pants that were in my closet for years and giving new life to this piece of hand woven. And to get the hand woven to bulk up enough to be able to be supported by the wool crepe, I did fuse an underlining on the back and there is an entire video on that which will be in the show notes below. And of course this dress is also a remake of an earlier piece. I had made, had woven this fabric for a demonstration in how to warp a loom uh, sectionally um, for a guild many years ago and I ended up making a gourd skirt from the fabric, a long skirt. I wore it for a number of demonstrations uh, back in the early 90s and then it sat in my closet for years. 
So I took the skirt panels, the, the wedged uh, skirt gores of the skirt all apart until the fabric was flat again, and then used this pattern, um, this Vogue pattern, to create panels, but not having enough width to do all of it, I was able to add a companion fabric of linen. And of course, because linen has no give at all, and this fabric did, I was able to fuse an underlining onto the back to make sure that it stayed put and didn't grow against the linen side panel. Another option is to break apart the pattern pieces into smaller sections. This jacket has a yoke, and the body was actually cut on the crosswise, so the weft is running vertically. Um, it was the easiest way to get out what I needed from the small amount of fabric that I had. If you look at the back here, you'll see the yoke cut in one direction, which is very common in a yoke like that, and the back is cut on the crosswise. I just want you to note that this jacket actually featured waist darts, but if I really had to break into smaller components, those waist darts could have been seams. This jacket, this princess seam jacket, um, though it's not hand woven, um, it could have been. I found this fabric, this beautiful fabric, uh, uh, in a commercial establishment, and um, it's something that I've always meant to look carefully at and actually try to reproduce on the loom. That said, I broke it into princess seams because there wasn't a whole lot of it, and the directions for how to do that are in the instruction manual for the 200 jacket um, that's available on my website. The link for that will be below, and those instructions are free. So there is a part in there that shows how to break this particular jacket apart into princess seams. So this uh, commercial equivalent, say of a hand woven, was paired with corduroy to extend it. And this jacket was made from tencel, A2 tencel fabric, which I wove, um, that was originally woven and made into a strapless dress for a companion garment for an ensemble for a fashion show from 2008, I believe. After a couple of years, I didn't need the dress anymore. Um, it had traveled with the, uh, with the exhibit. And I took the dress apart at every seam and was able to recut this strapless gown into this jacket. Now, to get everything to work, I had to add seams where there weren't any seams before. I mean, I did pick princess seams here so that I had narrower sections of the garment to work with. If you look on the back, you will see that the princess seam on the back, I've cut apart into yet an additional section by adding a seam right around the waist. Those added seams can work in different ways to be able to break apart pattern pieces into smaller components to fit on smaller pieces of fabric. And you can sometimes put design details in there, like inseam buttonholes. The piece on this dress form over here, this, this lovely blue mohair piece, used to be a long shawl collared bathrobe like coat that belonged to my mother-in-law and after she passed and I found it in her closet it was a piece that I had woven in my craft there days in the 80s and gave it to her as a gift. I found the piece in her closet and ended up taking all the pieces apart washing them to get them a little more dense and then I took all these small pieces and I made the jacket you see here. So there's a lot of seams in that and I was able to use some much smaller pieces to get that jacket out. When the fabric really isn't wide enough but it's really important to have a full back that you can't cut in two separate pieces for wh whatever reason, consider moving the side seams closer towards the back. In this walking vest, because of the shadow weave structure, there was no way to match two halves of the back and get these to line up. There was just no way. I only had enough length of cloth to do three lengths, two for the fronts and one for the back, and the cloth was not wide enough for a full back. So I figured out how much I could actually get out of the fabric if, um, if I left the back as one piece 
added seam allowance and then took off everything that was, you know, that didn't fit and attached it to the front. So here's where the seam starts at the vent and it travels up and you can see that it ends back here at the armhole opening, not at the side seam. This is all one piece with the front. I'll show how to do that in just a sec. So this is a jacket that I'm currently working on. You get to see a work in progress. I wove this fabric and recently pulled it off the loom. It uses some vintage wools that were on my shelf for the warp and this wonderful yarn I picked up on sale. I believe it's discontinued now. It's Noro Tayo Lace and the color gradation is engineered into it which gives this beautiful gradation in the weft. It was mostly predictable but not perfect. Occasionally there would be a knot which would throw off the sequence or I change skeins which would also throw off the sequence and um, it took me the better part of two days to figure out how to lay out these pieces to be able to get them at, to match as closely as possible um, horizontally you know so that the, the patterning matched up. I wanted this to be a kind of loose fitting uncondensed constructed comfy sweater you know to wear around the house as I continue to quarantine. My favorite go-to sweatery jacket something I bought in a shop on Whidbey Island years and years ago was really starting to show its age. Anyway because of the color gradation and the inconsistency in spots I couldn't get the fronts to match and find two lengths to also get the back to match. So taking a clue from that walking vest I just showed you, I was able to do a full back, find where it matched best the front panels, and then move the side seams around to the back. Now my plan had been, because they were selvages, is to not add seam allowance and to be able to crochet the edge, creating a, a kind of more sweatery like join and then overlap it with the front. So you know, here I have the crocheted edge. This is the actual selvage of the back fabric and it overlaps the front. And you can see I'm still in the process of crocheting around uh, the perimeter. So let me show you how I actually did that. So this shows, this scrap of fabric left from after cutting out shows the width of the cloth, the selvage to selvage. And based on that, and knowing I didn't need to add seam allowance because of the way I was going to construct the garment, I took the maximum width and that's what I cut. I drew lines to indicate this is where it's going to get cut off. Those are parallel to the center back so that um, any shaping in the side seams would have to get moved around to the front. Now let me just say if you have uh, a particularly fuller lower half this technique might not work because the angle that the side seam would have sat on would throw the whole side seams off grain. But for relatively balanced upper and lower halves this is a great technique. So the first step to do this was to indicate the side seam allowance on both the front and the back. And I had a line indicating where I needed to cut this piece so that I would have the maximum fabric on the back and the rest I could stick on the front. So once I cut the piece apart there, I then overlapped the two seam lines and I can tape those into place and then added back my seam allowance here but I didn't need to add it to this side because this was going to be finished off 
with the crocheted edge. This is a selvage edge and I could have just attached the selvage and sort of sewn it down or in this case I wanted to do a crocheted edge as a finish. And then that would just overlap here and I magically had this beautiful cardigan-esque kind of jacket that matched the patterning all the way around. Next time, we'll talk about my most favorite method of cheating when you don't have enough fabric by butting two selvages together.